Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast, a dreary one at FedEx Field where the Redskins lost 9 to nothing to the San Francisco 49ers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this game. It's not worth it. I, lo- I wanted to talk some big picture ticket items. So I brought on my ESPN counterpart in San Francisco, Nick Wagner. He's covered the Niners. He used to cover the Rams. He's been in some, he's covered some bad teams. I'm curious how the Rams and Niners got out of this. Can the Redskins follow their blueprint? I'm going to ask him about that as well as about Kyle Shanahan. And then I have Michael Phillips from the Richmond Times Dispatch on. We talk about a little bit more about Kyle Shanahan. Is there a revisionist history going on with his time in Washington? Some Kirk Cousins talk as well, and the decision to keep Case Keenum as a starter. And then I end with my observations from the game, again, focusing on the big picture. But first, my interview with ESPN's Nick Wagner. Okay, now I'm here with my guy, Nick Wagner, my counterpart with ESPN, who covers the San Francisco 49ers, and someone who has had it a lot worse than I have when it comes to covering bad football. So, he finally gets a good team to cover. Nick, thanks for joining me. I want to start off with Kyle Shanahan. And what do you what did you think this game meant to him? Well, it, it's funny because Kyle Shanahan, he actually tried to play it coy a little bit after the game. He was asked who got the game ball, and he said, kind of, just kind of, you know, brush the question aside a little bit. And then, of course, George Kittle, who <laughs> is known to not be able to help himself, the 49ers tight end, kind of spilled the beans a little later that that Kyle was going to award the game ball to his father, Mike. Okay. And I think that kind of gives you an idea of, hey, maybe it didn't mean the world to Kyle Shanahan, but it meant more than he was willing to let on, which is to be expected. It's a little sure. easier to let that kind of thing come out after the fact as opposed to giving the Redskins some motivation. But, you know, Kyle Shanahan said it himself. He said, you know, when it comes to family matters, you're always a little bit more sensitive. And I think that's probably true for you. It's true for me, true. and it's true for him. And, and I think that's why this one meant a little bit more, as much of a slog as it was. Right. Uh, and also, of course, to get to 6-0 and for the first time since sure. 1990. Uh, there's a lot of things that play into that. But but certainly, he hasn't forgotten what took place here. And, and he probably never will. He probably won't. And, you know, it's funny because Kyle, Kyle can rub people the wrong way, too. There's a lot of people here who didn't like him personally. I always thought he was a really good offensive coach. I got along with him, you know, in a professional level well. Um, but, you know, you could see the other side. But I also know that some of that other side stemmed from him thinking that this organization treated his dad poorly. So during the week leading up to it, we, we know the quotes. Did you see something different in him? Uh, no, I really didn't. And I, and I think the thing with, with Kyle Shanahan is that he's one of those guys, and I think this is what you want in a coach who's pretty much always the same. I think there's a little swagger there kind of based on his age and uh, the way he kind of relates to his players. And you've seen that, I think, also when you kind of get the, the reputation as being kind of one of the bright offensive minds of the game. That swagger is part of that. But I didn't really see any of that change. You know, he was very honest. The thing with Kyle Shanahan is, you know, one thing about him, he's the guy that everyone says they want in their coach, right. you know. He doesn't really change from week to week. He's got a little bit of swagger to him. As you know, you've been around him. But, you know, he really has kind of put that side of himself away a little bit because they haven't gotten the results on the field. And I I think maybe you're starting to see that come out. But I don't think it has anything to do with this game. I think it's more just a function of the team is 6-0. They're riding high. They're all kind of looking to him to be the guy who sets the tone. But I think he does a really good job of kind of being even-handed when it comes to, to the way he handles his team and making sure that they're not getting too far ahead of themselves. And just to give you a quick example, one veteran in that locker room told me during the week that after the win against the Rams on Wednesday, you know, they're riding high, huge win against a division opponent. Kyle Shanahan got in the film room and showed them all of the bad plays they made in that game. And that's something that he does actually on a fairly regular basis. He has he has a good, uh, real good hand on the pulse, kind of figuring out where his team's at and what they need mm-hmm. in a given week. So I don't think it I don't think it came out necessarily in him that that this meant more to him, but I think it was very clear and certainly it was after the game when you hear about him giving the game ball to, to his father and all that, that it did mean just a little bit. It did, you know, and like I said, you know, he was he can rub some people the wrong way with that arrogance. But I also know I talked to him this summer for a story on when I did with Sean McVeigh and Kyle, or Matt LaFleur. And I know there was a reluctance on his part to be lumped with them, especially with Sean, because he said, I haven't done anything yet, which is funny because he does have that arrogance, but he also understands the records. 
Yeah, and he and he's the first one to tell you, and, and you weren't the only one that you know. I, no. I thought maybe it was just you because of your personality <laughs> that he was rejected. He didn't want to speak to you, which you know, frankly, I, I had that, I had the same thought before I walked into this, this room out. today. I, I so, can't edit this. So, so, but no, I, I do, I do think that the thing with Kyle Shanahan is that he is, like I said, pretty similar from week to week, and and I think that he came into this season saying, hey. I haven't done anything yet. You know, people want to people want to lump me in with these great offensive minds, and he has, from an offensive standpoint, shown that his designs can do that. But he really understands, and I think he's coming into his own as a head coach. And you're seeing that this year, just in the way he's putting trust in his defense. And he had to do it today, of course, certainly yeah. because it started raining. He even admitted after the game. I asked him, "Is this one of those games where you just want it to be over? Once you get a lead, you just want it to be over as quick as possible?" And he said, "Yes." He was talking about how the defense, he can, he can put his trust in the defense because yeah. they've kind of proved themselves, and he did the same thing last week against the Rams. And I think you're seeing real growth in him in that way where it's not just foot on the gas all the time. Certainly everyone remembers what happened in that Super Bowl, but I think he's moved past that, and I think he's really kind of growing and, and evolving as a head coach. Right. And the funny thing is the one thing he's done that his dad couldn't do here is get a really good defensive coordinator and the guy's making it work. And that's so, like, for all this stuff about the play calling and all that, it's who you're, who you're picking to surround yourself with is going to make the big difference. And their defense really plays well. This yeah. is what people hoped that the Redskins' defense would be. And, and it's funny because you know how this kind of thing goes. Robert Sala, the Niners' defensive yeah. coordinator, last year was kind of the guy everyone, a lot of pointed, people pointed to, and, oh, he's going to be the fall guy. He's going to be the guy that they sweep out because he's a first-time coordinator and there's all these questions about him. But... Really, I, Richard Sherman has said this to me on and off the record about just this is a defense that a year ago it had so many moving pieces that they were consistently having coverage busts. And I'm, I don't mean like yeah. one or two, like five, six, seven a game. Hard. And it, you can't overcome that. And part of that was they were playing, you know, musical safeties all the time and, and those types of things. But that's not on the defensive coordinator. If he's calling right. the right thing and he's got you in the right position – but they went out, they addressed the pass rush, they get D Ford, they get Nick Bosa. You saw it in very brief glimpses today because the Redskins didn't give a whole lot of opportunities Both to rush passes. the passer. But when they, they actually did drop Redskins. back, yeah. it was tough for Case Keenum. And, 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 you, and you got a real kind of a taste of that. But everything they do kind of spins off of that front four. They're able to rush just four all the time. It makes Robert Sala look better. It makes Kyle Shanahan look better. It makes John Lynch look better. And it's a big reason why they're But he also is aggressive with what he does with that front. When they rush the passer, because what I liked watching them leading up to this is the aggressiveness with some of the stunts and some of the games. So he's not willing to just say, hey, we got four good pass rushes, let's go. Well, and that's kind of the beauty of it, right? When you can get home with four, then when you actually do bring the blitz, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to pick it up. And they've got a couple of guys. You know, Kwan Williams is their nickel corner, one of the smallest guys on the roster. But he's outstanding as a, as a blitzer, and Robert Sala will use him in different ways and get him involved. Quan Alexander, who is like lightning, I mean, he has been kind of the under underrated or overlooked addition to this defense, and partially understandably because of what Ford and Bosa have brought. But he's really kind of transformed them at that second level of the defense, and so Robert Sala has a really good feel for kind of when to press the button and when not to on the blitz. And so that's why, even though they blitz, maybe I think it's less than every team but one in the league. I think Detroit's the only right. team that blitzes less. But when they when they do it, it actually works. And I think this is I'm bringing this up because I think this is all stuff that Redskins fans need to hear. Because I think again, this is a defense. When you look at the Redskins defense, you see the talent base, and there are a couple more pieces that they can get, and you could get to this level. Because like, whether or not they're going to get to the Niners level next year, it's going to be sure. dependent on a lot of things. But the talent base is there, so there are things that you can look and say, okay, last year the Niners were in this situation, and now they're in this. So I continuing along those themes too is as I brought up in the opening. You haven't covered a winning team since... <laughs> well, never, actually. Right. This is my been, 16th year covering the NFL. and the, the People best feel I've bad for me, it. and I'm going to say, no, no, it was this guy. So. Yeah, no, but yeah, they're three wins away from cementing the first winning record I've, I've ever covered uh, in the NFL. That's, that dates 16 and, years. And for the people who don't know, of course, right. I, I covered the Rams for a long period of time. Before this, I've covered the Niners. This is my fourth year, and the last three years, of course, has been kind of dreary as well. But uh, yeah, certainly something different. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. Out, John. Well, you know, but the thing I want to ask too, because people who follow Redskins have very little hope. You've covered a couple of teams that whose fan base probably had little hope at times. Yeah. What turned it around? Because like, we're not talking like yeah. the Niners ownership group was not very good. 
the Rams ownership group did not have a good reputation, right? Correct. So what turned it around? I know they got McVay and yeah. Kyle, but there's something else that's got to turn it around. I, I love that I'm your go-to expert on losing here, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's not exactly the title I want, but it's a, it's a badge I'll wear. With, I'm going to get it. I'll wear, I'll wear the badge with honor if I have to. But, you know, I, I think when you, when you look at it, the first thing that's important to remember is that, you know, you'll always see people say, well, 49ers, overnight sensations, they turned it around overnight. That's almost never true. There's almost true. never a team that turned it right. around overnight. They went through a bunch of different, you know, losing periods, and they figured things out as they as they went along. And so there's always kind of, it, it's kind of like a, a stages thing, you know? Like, there's the first stage, which is acceptance. And you have to figure out, okay, we have problems at the big, highest levels of our organization. That starts with the, you know, if it's a, the, a team president, right. perhaps, in some perhaps. cases, or a, a general oh. or a general yeah. manager, uh, and the head coach and and the smart teams generally not every case because the Rams are actually one of the exceptions to this is they make a, a total change you know you sweep right. everybody out and you make sure that those that head coach and that general manager or that president are on the same page I know that's been an issue here it and is. that's something that fans are still curious about but I'm a big believer now now the Rams are the exception because they kept general manager Les right. Snead in place but the big difference that people need to know is is that Jeff Fisher was the guy really kind of pressing the buttons, making a lot of those decisions and a lot of the draft picks and things that didn't work out. Jeff Fisher was the guy kind of pressing the button there. So Les Snead was was in the background a little bit, and now he's a little bit more empowered with Sean McVay. And so it, it's a, it's just a different dynamic. But, uh, you know, they had their turnaround largely because, you know, they already had some really good right. pieces in place there. You had Todd Gurley. You had Aaron right. Donald. And so you have to give credit to the previous regime to get those guys. It was coaching them up, getting the most out of them. Coaching staffs are so underrated in right. this league. It is so important. And I don't just mean at the head coach position. Those assistants. Staffs. Yeah, how good of a staff can yeah, you put absolutely. together? And that's one of the things. You know, the, the Niners did this offseason. Kyle Shanahan made some changes. He brought right. in a new defensive line coach. He brought in a new secondary coach. You know, Joe Woods, Chris Kacerik, well-respected guys around the league who maybe weren't available when he got hired, but he saw an opportunity to upgrade. So that's kind of the thing I always remind people is it's gonna it's a little bit of a process, but I also think it's very important to make sure that when you get things started and you start on your actual rebuild, because that comes after the acceptance sure. stage, right? right? So sometimes it can be four or five years or never, is having people at the highest levels of the organization and the head coach on the same exact page all the time. Did you think the Niners, because you've been around the Niners, well, I guess you started covering the Kyle Shanahan, right? That no, was Chip Kelly was my first Chip, Okay, Chip yep. was. So you knew the ownership, though. Did you have, did you think the ownership could turn it around there? I did because I, I, I got the impression from being around that Jed, Jed York does want to win, but he had to get past the idea of maybe some of the uber loyalty that he had there. And that was the problem. It was, you know, after, after the Jim Harbaugh thing, which fell apart largely because there was that friction. There was that, that fracture there that happened between Harbaugh and the front office. And that was before my time, but we all knew what was happening. We all saw and read everything that happened there. And then he hires Jim Tom Sula. So Tom Sula is kind of Balky's hand-picked guy. Right. And I think that was as much a function of, well, Jim Tom Sula is going to do what Trent Balky wants. And he was in over his head. Great great position sure. coach, as you, as you know as well as anyone. And then the next year they bring in Chip Kelly. And again, and, and Jed York is the first one to admit this, his mistake was he didn't sweep it clean. He didn't start over with you know, the GM and the head coach and bring them in together. So when Jed York went to hire Kyle Shanahan, who was their number one choice for the job, he went to Kyle and he said, who out of these candidates that we've talked to general manager do you have a good relationship with? And Kyle, I don't think he had bad relationship with those guys. He probably just didn't know them that well. And that was kind of how the John Lynch thing was born. And John right. Lynch was put into a position that he had never been in before, but a lot of it was just about having that chemistry. And Kyle Shanahan, obviously, is the guy with the most juice in that organization. Right. He has a lot of power. But he and John Lynch, they have meetings every day. They talk to each other all the time. What's going on with the roster? What can we do here? They've had a bunch of injuries this year. What, you know, do we need to go outside and, and add someone? And, and I still think that, you know, it, I always say – the fastest way to lose and the fastest way to turn winning into losing is to not have a general manager or the person making the personnel decisions and the head coach on the same page. And sometimes it's even the same guy and they still butt heads right. within themselves. And the funny thing is I know, like, because I'm trying to give Redskins fans a, a, some sort of light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah. And, so, and I'm not sure that I – it's not my job to do that. Yeah. But, like, you know, you see can it, can it be done. And when you're talking about that, the problem that I see here is yep. – a lot of people aren't willing to, they're not making sweeping, they're not going to make sweeping changes. Right. And will they be on the same page? I think that remains to be seen. But I think what, you know, there are ways that you can turn things around if you're willing to make 
certain. Changes. Yeah, I think it comes down. Sometimes it's just a matter of putting egos aside, yeah. and and you know, like I All put I put mine aside good. to come in here and talk to you. <laughs> I mean, so that's a that's a big step for me. You know, I'm sure you appreciate it, but Graham, no, <laughs> Graham, cut the stop the check. I'm just, stop I'm, just, the check. I'm just kidding, but no, I I mean I I really do believe that that's you know I I came in when I started covering the Rams. It was it was the opposite. They went from winning to losing. Right. It was right at the end of the greatest show on turf. And you know what fractured that? Mike Martz wanted the credit for all the success. Jay Zygmunt wanted the credit for all the success. Charlie Army, who was the general manager. So you actually had three people. You had a president, Oof. a GM, and a head coach. They all wanted the credit for the success. And then when they lost the second the second Super Bowl they went to, it was, and I'm pointing my <laughs> arms in opposite directions right now, it was, it was, oh, it was their fault. And immediately, that's the fracture. It deteriorates over time. And all of a sudden, everything in your organization deteriorates as well. Beautiful. Ending a dreary day with on that note for these Redskins fans. They're going to be driving off the road listening to this. So, but I appreciate it, Nick. Great insight. Again, it can be done. It's just there has to be some willingness to make changes. Nick, thanks a lot for joining me. You got it. Always good to see you, my friend. I know. Jokes aside. It, it is good to see you, isn't it? <laughs> thanks. After this break, I'll be back with Michael Phillips from the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Did the Redskins make a mistake sticking with Case Keenum? Welcome back. Now, here's my conversation with Michael Phillips from the Richmond Times-Dispatch. It was a miserable day here. We're sitting in a booth here at Redskins, or excuse me, at FedEx Field, where there is a little bit of leakage. Um, a lot of leakage in this building, as we know. It kind of sums it up. But uh, speaking of leaks, let's go to the Shanahan's. All right, there this we go. How about well this? Done, this, is, wow. this is just setting I'm, up I'm well. I'm just here to appreciate it now. <laughs> that was, that was, I'm pretty smooth. Um, with Kyle, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what they had in him and what the Shanahan era was. There also seems to be a little bit of revisionism going on here. And I saw you had a little bit of exchange with our favorite guy, Chris Russell, on Twitter. Yep. But what, what's your take on, on just what they accomplished here and, you know, again, what they had in those guys? Sure, and, and you could say two things. Kyle Shanahan is a very successful NFL coach right. now. He's doing a great job. And the Shanahans did not have success in D.C., and they were not on the verge of having success, and they were not going to have success. No matter how long you had given them, no matter if they had drafted Robert Griffin III or not, this was not an organization that was trending in the right direction. They were losing a lot of football games. They had the one year with Robert, which obviously was a complete aberration. They did a very nice job maximizing his talents for that year. But if he hadn't been here, that was going to be a double-digit loss year would be my read on it. Yeah, that because they, I mean, there was three out of four double-digit double digit losses. And yeah. I thought they did a really good job that year. They did a good job with him. but And we all knew Sean McVay was a talent when he was in the building. Right. I don't know if we knew Matt LaFleur was going to be everything he yeah, is now, but he, he was a bright young kid. But that, that doesn't, just because those guys are good at what they do, doesn't mean that... that had they stayed here, this organization would be in any better of a place. Well, I think the other thing to keep in mind, too, with Kyle, and I want to skip ahead to the Redskins' current situation, but with him, when they fired him, they weren't going to keep him. They fired his dad. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's be, they didn't let him get out of the building. They fired his dad. He wasn't going to stay after they fired his dad. I mean, so it's not like, so while they had him, the only way he was going to work here is if they had success and his dad left. And I would say the one takeaway I have is that you, you look at Jay Gruden, who I think Jay Gruden and Kyle Shanahan, both very smart offensive yeah, minds in the NFL. You look at what Kyle did in the Super Bowl, obviously leading that Falcons team there. You look at what he's done. But for both those guys, it's about the defense. And Jay never found a good defensive coordinator right. here. He never found a good defensive mix here. And Kyle struggled in San Francisco. And now this year, what's he got? He's got a defense. He's got a defense. And, and you cannot do it on one side of the football, no matter how brilliant you are. You need the other part to be working, too. And that's what Kyle's found that's working out And it's for funny because his dad had a hard time finding that in yep. Denver and then in here as well. And, it, you know, if you're a head coach, it's not about it's not about putting calling plays, it's about putting together a good coaching staff, good roster, et cetera. It's about so much more than calling plays and designing an offense. But let's kick ahead to this team. Um, Bill Callahan says that Case Keenum is going to continue to start. Good or bad decision? Well, it's a decision you have to make because you play on Thursday. It, it would be, Correct. you know, 
everybody wants to see Haskins, and I'm to the point now where I want to see Haskins too. That's all the intrigue that's left this the year. The only thing that's getting me on TV the rest of the year, <laughs> let's be honest. Nobody, <laughs> it would be a terrible idea to throw him out on Thursday sure, on the short absolutely. week. They, they probably won't have a real practice this week. It'll probably just be walkthroughs. Uh, to, to throw him out there would be irresponsible. That's So you have to give Case the vote of confidence because he's the quarterback. Sure. So it, it, how bad of a look would that be from the podium? Uh, well, no, we don't believe in Case, but we kind of have to start him Thursday because it's and a short week. Ab- That's absolutely. the thing Callahan had to say today. I think the question is, mm-hmm. well, what's the week where he It better be finish? Buffalo. We're done here. We're, we're done here. I've seen what I need to see, and today was the rain and whatever. But it, you know, you've got a longer week to get ready for Buffalo. By week coming off of it where he can learn from whatever the game tape shows you, it's showtime for the kid. It. I know there was that kind of delusion, oh, they're 1-5, but they're just two games back. They could sneak their way back into the NFC East picture. That's done now. 1-6, and six, it's done. It's about the future. Bring the kid in. Let's see what he's got. It starts in Buffalo to me. And speaking of Minnesota, because this is kind <laughs> of a condensed week for yeah. us and doing all this stuff, so I want to jump ahead to that. And Kirk. Always a road game on the short Kirk week, by the way. Kirk, 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 Kirk Cousins. Cousins. <laughs> we'll see if they, somebody says Kirk this week. But now we got Kirk Cousins here. Let's look back a couple years. Did they make a mistake at all with him? No, I, I think that they've been validated in hindsight. And Kirk Cousins, to me, is still one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the world. He deserves to be a starter on an NFL team. He does not, however, need to be your franchise guy, the cornerstone, the $30 million guy. That is a mistake building around that. You look at what Minnesota had with Case Keenum, that, that money freed up for other things. Kirk's still very good at what he does. He's elite at what he does, but he is not one of the, you know, those top tier guys you right. spend the money. You look at quarterbacks in the NFL. There's Absolutely. two ways to win. You've got a Brad, Rogers or a Brady, Mahomes now, guys you spend the money on, or you've got a rookie quarterback and you save the salary cap room from there. He, if you have him on a cap friendly deal, he's an asset to your team. If you have him on an expensive deal, he's not. So what are you expecting from him Thursday night? Because we know that like. He's a guy who would clearly, you know, Kyle Shanahan came out and was very clear about his feelings for the organization. <laughs> Kirk will not he say will not. those things, but you know. The fire burns. Absolutely. The fire burns. I, I think that it will be a run-heavy game plan. I think they will take yeah. the ball out of Kirk's hands because they've seen, <laughs> they've seen these things when, when he gets a little too in his own headspace. That's not good for him. It may actually be good for him to have the short week right. that he doesn't have to think about this too, too much going into it. I think they may have to take the ball away from him to win, but let's not kid ourselves. They're the better football team and they're playing. Right. And, they're going to win. And Dalvin Cook's playing tremendous. So yeah. I think that, that's why it's like, I think that's... Back-to-back great, great outings for Kirk, including uh, today, Sunday. Right. Um, he, he's on a roll coming in. Don't let, don't make him do too much. Let him manage the game and win. That's all you need to do to beat these guys. And it's funny because Case Keenum's going back there, and there's like this little yeah. bit of an odd game here where you got the Case going back, and that's what they had. That's who, they, that's who he's replacing. And Kurt, you know, we all know what happened here. So it's how about kind of how about 26 running 26 with a chip on his back. shoulder? Yeah. 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 How about that? A lot of storylines here. That's what we need at this point. Listen. We got to get through these final eight or nine weeks somehow. The Thursday's entertaining enough on its own, yes. the Kirk versus Case factor. Every other game this year is not interesting beyond Haskins coming and in. And I or agree. The, like the, that. For us, the only thing yeah. that matters as far as what people want to read about is how is Dwayne Haskins developing? Yeah. Because that's the number one storyline, not just for because they want to see him, because they need to, they, fans want to know. Like, I think the coaches have a good idea in him right now. Fans want to know, like, what can this kid do? Is there something that you can look forward to with him? Peyton Manning's got the NFL record. Rook interceptions as a rookie. 28, I think. Something like Through a lot of interceptions. Yeah. But you could see he was going to be good. You could see the traits. And we see it at times with Haskins, too, that his ability to sense the pocket. He's very good at shifting when he needs to shift, sensing when he's under pressure. The arm is great. There are things you can see that he's going to be good. The rest of it is a big, full question mark. And, and we want to see it. We want to see it out on the field. Yeah, and like I said, if for, for us that's left, that's the only interesting interesting thing because it's really not going to be – I mean, in, in, we, in December, like, well, if they lose, they could have the third overall draft spot. Or if they win, they'll have four. You know, that's that's going to get a little bit old really soon. So it is about the point. And, and I, I have no indications – Dwayne Haskins is anything other than the guy going forward. But if you're sitting on the number two or number three overall draft pick, now you're probably looking at trade offers. You know, you take sure. a quarterback number two. That's sure. what you do in the NFL right now. So you've got to make that decision, and you're probably trading the pick, which is its own offseason entry. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, America's podcast guest, Michael Phillips, Richmond Times-Dispatch. 
Get behind that paywall and read them. <laughs> my pleasure. All right, thanks, Mike. <laughs> After this break, I'll be back with my observations, including some talk on the quarterbacks, a little bit what I've been hearing on Dwayne Haskins, and more. Okay, now it's time for my observations. Let's start with the locker room. The Redskins are 1-6, and six and it was a miserable day to be on the field. Nobody will doubt that. But you also want to measure how players respond to these situations, and one way for me is, is to see how they deal with the media after games. Granted, there are other ways to do this, so this isn't about ripping guys or just whatever, but there are some who stand out in this area every week, and it speaks volumes. A few guys decline to talk after the Redskins loss, and just so you know, they are required to talk by the league. Um, Morgan Moses typically does not talk after a loss. And honestly, I don't think that's a good sign. I don't think it's a good look, I should say. I've covered some great players here who always talked win or lose. And I'll put, up, I'll put guys up like Adrian Peterson. It was a tough day for him because of that fumble. There have been days where his numbers are bad for whatever reason. But Peterson answers every question every week. He did so again on Sunday. He might not be here next season with the new coach, but fans should hope that his approach rubs off on others. I remember a game back in my first year or so covering this team when, when Brian Mitchell had a tough day. I think there was a fumble or two or something like that. It may have been a loss to Seattle. I don't remember the specifics, but he answered every question. And I remember asking him at the end, this is back in the RFK days, I remember asking him at the end why he felt he, needed the, he felt the need to stand up and answer every question after a day like that. Um, I wasn't used to the pro game per se, so this was new for me. But he said essentially, if you want to soak up the praise, you better put up with the other side and face the hard questions. He wanted to stand up and be accountable for his game. When guys don't do it, you lose some level of accountability ability, and that's not good. But I'll pay closer attention to those who do. My experience has taught me that the guys who do last a long time for a reason. Number two, the quarterback decision. Bill Callahan had no choice but to stick with Case Keenum as a starting quarterback, especially as Michael Phillips said earlier, in a short week. I also think for those looking at the situation, you kind of need to take a slightly different approach. Instead of wondering, because this is what I get on Twitter or on social media, instead of wondering what the hell are the Redskins thinking in an angry way, you should ask yourself in a way that suggests what are they seeing or not seeing from Haskins. You don't think they know he's the future? You don't think they want him to be ready or need him to be ready? It's a hell of a benefit to every coach if Haskins is ready and they could put him out there. Don't forget that. Ask yourself, what aren't they seeing yet? I haven't talked to any coach or player who suggests that he should be playing. You need to pay attention sometimes to what you're not hearing. And that is you know, what the, the phrase is that Haskins is somehow being held back by the coaches, but you're not hearing that come out from the players. So that doesn't mean he's a bust or that he will be. It doesn't mean he's a bad kid or not. I always hear that he's a good kid. I don't even know. I don't need to say that, but I'm just, I am saying it. But that doesn't, and that doesn't mean he'll never do it. It just explains why he's not playing yet. He would have benefited greatly from another year or two in college. So now he's getting that training in the NFL. If he went in now, it would be, it would not be the best position to have success especially as he's still learning, and then you look at the talent around him, it's just not conducive for him to have success. He needs guys who can make plays for him, and there's really only one guy that could do that. It's Terry McLaurin. But, and I know the chemistry thing, but you need more than that. Now, if they keep focusing on the run game, that will help Haskins. It will help foster some of the growth. They can put together packages that benefit him when he's ready based off what they do in the run game and the play-action throws that can result. Again, I get why fans want to see him. I would like to see him too. But, the, you know, I think from my standpoint, my job is much more interesting if he plays, when he plays. There's a lot more, and this, this is a lost season. He's the one thing that I can look at and say I can chronicle his growth. That is more appealing to me than watching all this. But you need to keep in mind, they're one in six. Keenum isn't the answer, and that's why I know the fan. That's where I, I completely sympathize with the fans. But you also want Haskins to be the answer. That means play him when he's closer to being ready. You want to see the positive growth 
and and it and, and that's what they want to see. And really, this is a silly word because it's the Seventy Sixers, but it's about the process. This isn't about well, was this a good throw or bad throw? It's got to be about do you understand why you made this throw or went to this went made this read? That's when you start to know a guy is really starting to get it. So, anyways, with Haskins, it's really hard to know where he's truly at right now. Bill Callahan's mo since taking over is to do the opposite of what Jay Gruden has done. That means with practices, with meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But he's still not playing Haskins because they do know what they have in him for right now. And I know fans want to see him because they want to see what he can do, but the coaches are with him. They're, they're in the meeting rooms with him. They're on the practice fields with him. He gets all the scout team reps. They do measure those scout team reps. Those are not taken lightly by them. They, see the, they can see your footwork. They can see your progression and a read. Even if it's not your offense, they can still measure aspects of your game. Don't forget that. Um, but one thing that I do think has been important here is that Callahan seems to be taking a more nurturing approach, and I think that's good. I've seen a slight change in Haskins on the field in terms of the body language or just in terms of the energy maybe is a better word, but I don't know yet if that's, is that real or is that just something I'm looking for. But it is something you talk to some people, and I think that there's some elements of truth to that. I do know that he's watching some extra film with guys like Colt McCoy. I think that's a good thing. I think McCoy, whatever you guys all say about him, okay, fine, whatever. McCoy is a damn smart player. That's why he stayed in this league. You see, you've seen what's happened, but there's value to him because of that knowledge. It could just mean that he's not going to be a great quarterback here, but he could be a really good coach someday. I think part of that coaching is going on with Haskins with, from McCoy. And I think Keenum has tried to do stuff too, but I think McCoy is in a better spot to help him even more. If I'm the Redskins, I tell Alex Smith, or I you know, get him in with Haskins twice a week or so to go over more things with him. There's a wealth of tutoring knowledge available to Haskins. What I want to do is for myself as a reporter is find out in the next week or two is how much are they using all those resources available to him and how much it's helping him and how and where. And I don't know what Smith has been doing with him. That is something I am curious about um, because I do think he could be a big help even if he's not playing. Now, I have said before, I think he's a bigger help if he is playing because you can, he's your, you're around it more. But even without him being there, he can, still, he can still provide a level of help. Okay, on to number four. Michael and I talked about Cousins a little bit, so I don't want to revisit that time too much. But the thing I've always said in this, and it remains true, if the Redskins had really wanted to keep him, they had to sign him before putting that first franchise tag on him. So anyone who says they made a mistake, to me, that was the biggest one. It would have cost them $57 million in guaranteed money over three years. That was the only legit time to make it happen because once the tag was applied, the chances of him coming back were almost nil. I know that one of his hesitations was this, and it goes back to the scouting or this the, the overall evaluation of talent. And his comment, I know, would be if they made a mistake on him, who else did they make, make one with? And who else would they make one with in the future? And the other thing with that, that I always go back to in this situation is that they really should have moved him after the 2016 season. Don't bring him back for a third year. People in that building knew he wasn't coming back, um, and they, were, they advocated for a trade. It should have happened. I think that's where you know Bruce Allen's instincts have been wrong in too many cases, and I think that's definitely one of them because he held on thinking it would change. It didn't. They, did, they weren't going to ever sign him, and he moved on, and you know that is. There it is. But I never would have paid him more than what they paid Alex Smith. To me, he was not a guy you're going to pay $28 million. I think I always thought he at times could play like a top 10 quarterback and other times would play like he was ranked 20 or lower because that's, that's what it was. Um, that's, so that's the level of pay I would have been comfortable with giving him at that time. The funny thing is, at the end, he and Jay Gruden did not get along well. But they were better with one another than they were apart from one another. I think this offense was good for him. I wonder how life would have gone for both of them had the Redskins been able to work something out. Number five, I still think the Redskins have the base of a good defense. When people talk about culture, I think you need to break it down and separate it into various factions. There's culture in the entire building with the coaches in the front office. Then I think there's locker room culture, and then you can break down even more. I think the defensive culture um, is, is, looks like it's, I think it's pretty good. I think, it seems like. I like the young talent on that group, and paired with a really good coordinator, I think you could do a lot more, as, as you heard Nick and I discuss with the Niners earlier in the podcast. I also think they're starting to do better, and to be honest, with better offense Sunday, they could have pulled the upset win. 
few weeks ago, they were blown up by New England, but the defense kept it interesting for a while. They need to do a better job with pressure packages. They need to find another playmaker, especially as a pass rusher, a guy who can get home a lot faster, and they need some better, more solid play in the secondary. I know that sounds like a lot, but I don't think it's quite as far as I think this overall team is. That will take coaching, but also another high-quality starter or two. They will have some um, cap space available this offseason, especially after they make some moves. Um, they'll have even more, and they're going to have some high picks. I think they need to add some impact players. You could make this a really good defense still. I haven't given up on that part of it. Um, I will be curious where this group goes in 2020, but they do have guys who can make it work and grow together, and I think that's the problem on offense. It's really hard to know who's going to be even starting here beyond the season or in 20, or 2020 or even 2021. With the defense, you have a pretty good idea, and I think that's a good place for any coach coming in to look at that group and say, well, at least we have this side of the ball covered. And by we, I mean that's his words, not mine. I don't say we for this. That's his, the new coach talking. Um, but I think you have to have a base for somebody to entice them, and that will be part of the enticement. Anyway, that's it from me for today. Thank you very much to my ESPN counterpart, Nick Wagner. You can read his stuff on ESPN.com. Thanks also to Michael Phillips from the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Hang in there.